Hello, Aaron Estrada here. In this first lesson, we're going to start at the very beginning and talk about the fundamentals, like what's a pixel and how do digital images work. It's probably going to be a review for a lot of you, but since I don't know what the backgrounds of people coming into the course are, we've got to start at the very beginning. And besides, a little bit of review never hurt anyone. You might learn some details or little nuances about how pixels work that you never thought of before. So what is a pixel? Pixel stands for picture element, and it's the smallest atom, or I guess you could call it a molecule, of a digital image. A digital image is made of a regular rectangular array of pixels. Each pixel holds a value. White, one equals white, 0.5, you can look at the color picker here, 0.5 is like a gray value and as you get lower in value you get darker and darker until zero is black. Now this is in floating point notation. Which brings us to the issue of bit depth floating point versus integer. Traditional digital images, like what you'd mostly find on the internet and on the web, I should say like JPEG, PNG, uh, those sort of formats, are only 8 bits in depth. Now what does that mean? Well, if each of these pixels holds a value, how is it stored? Well, it's stored in digital data in the form of bits. Bit depth is the level of precision that a pixel carries. Higher precision requires more bits. Bit depth can be either integer or floating point. 8 bit per sample, which is very common in web graphics, will provide 2 to the 8th power possible levels for each component. 10 bits will do 2 to the 10th, so 1,024 possible levels for each component. There is also floating point formats, and there's two like very common formats that you find in computer graphics, 16-bit half, and then 32-bit float, which provides immense precision. So we've seen how a regular array of pixels can form an image and that each pixel can hold a value that defines color or brightness, but how do we get actually get color? I've created a little illustration here to help show that. Each pixel can hold more than one plane of data or more than one value, so it can hold values for the red, green, and blue pixels, allowing it to emulate a, or to feed a tri-stimulus system for generating color. So each pixel is holding red, green, and blue values, and those red, green, and blue values stack up, add together, to create the output color. So in any kind of system like a, a CRT or an LCD or a projector that has red, green, and blue guns or drivers or pixels, display pixels, can take those red, green, and blue values and put them up on the screen and hence emulate any color that can be defined by a tri-stimulus system. So that's how a digital image can hold color, by having multiple planes that hold values for each primary. But they can hold more than even that. They can hold data. So here's an image from a digital render that defines the depth of each pixel. So as the renderer was running, it also wrote out a value for how f deep into the scene each of these pixels were. And that's one of the great things about working in floating point, which is, which is what Na uh, Nuke does natively full time, is it can ingest floating point images and manipulate them. So even non sort of visual data, this, this data normally wouldn't, you wouldn't look at it directly. It would only be used for driving other aspects of image making, but Nuke can ingest it and, and properly manipulate these really large floating point values. Along with floating point, you get the ability to deal with high dynamic range images as well. And that's one of the great features of Nuke. 
So let's compare a high dynamic range image to a standard range image. Here I have an 8-bit image, PNG, just like something you'd find on the internet, a JPEG or a PNG. The sky is really bright here, so I'm going to try to darken the sky to, to recover some of this detail in the sky. I'm just going to multiply it by a fixed value here. And you'll see as the image is darkening, the sky is not really revealing any more detail here in these overexposed areas. It's just turning a grayish color. That's a limitation of this 8-bit container. Uh, these old fixed precision formats can only hold values up to 1. So I've ingested this into Nuke. And now when I try to adjust it, I get nothing but a gray mess. But Nuke can ingest and manipulate floating point images properly. So here's a floating point image. And you can see it's also highly overexposed in the window here. And as I pixel probe it, you can see these values go very, very high. Some of these values are going in, into the hundreds. So I'll do the exact same thing here. I will darken the image just using a simple multiply. We'll view it there. And as you can see, the information is recovered, or it's I'm darkening values that were over range into a, a viewable range. And that's an, actually another interesting concept or valuable concept to think about in a program that can manipulate high dynamic range images. There is the data in the buffers, and then there is what can be displayed to the screen. All of these values that go over 1 in Nuke can't be directly displayed. It doesn't mean that they're not there, and that's why these things like these pixel probes are so important. I can probe this image and I can see, oh, this white area here does have data in it. It just can't be seen in the viewer because the viewer can only display things that go up to 1. That's an unfortunate limitation of our current display technology. There's no, there's no monitor that can put these, these values up on the screen for you. So Nuke needs to just feed the monitor values that it can display, that clip off at 1, and that's all you can see. We're going to talk more about the viewer and how to, how to work in Nuke in this lesson, but in, a, in another chapter. But for now, uh, we can see the sweetness of dealing with floating point images and being able to manipulate the data even in high dynamic range in Nuke. And just to prove the floating point precision in Nuke and just how flexible it is, I'm going to do a massively destructive edit that in a traditional system would destroy the image. I'm going to take this image of Marcy, which is the Kodak test scan, and I'm going to multiply this image by um, over a million which will completely blow the image out. Cl clip it all above one. These values are astronomical right now, if you can see from the color picker. I threw a couple transforms in just so to prove there's no tricks, that it's not like the color is being messaged through to this next node, and then reverse the color correction. We'll compare the original to the manipulated one, and you can see a, that's the original. This is a manipulated one. The data, the numbers aren't even rounding, and there's no visual loss at all. So the precision within Nuke, its ability to process floating point with such high precision is, is a huge feature that allows for uh, incredible manipulation in color without as much risk of damage. In addition to doing all its calculations in floating point precision, Nuke also uses what's called a linear light representation of the data. So what is linear light? Well, linear light means there is no gamma or other nonlinearities in the image. To help illustrate what gamma is, I created a little setup here where we can see the visual result of a gamma change and also a waveform plot. Gamma is a power function that manipulates only the midtone values of an image but not white which is represented at the top of the graph here or black. 
So let's adjust the gamma of this image. See, as I bring the gamma down, the image of Marcy darkens. And we can see from the plot that only the mid-tone values are being affected. White stays the same, and so does black. Traditional images that were prepared for television display or direct display on com computer monitors typically have a gamma built into them. This is a side effect of the need for a couple things. The first I'll talk about here, which is that all CRTs have their own built-in gamma. It's just a side effect of the physics of the way a CRT works that will darken an image like this. So if you were to take an image that you intended to display linearly like this and put that data directly on a CRT, it would seem to darken the image. Something like this. So this is what you'd see if you just put a linear image straight on a CRT. So what the designers did in the past to solve this problem is that they baked a compensating gamma into the image, a gamma like this, so that when they displayed the image directly on the screen, the two would cancel out, this would cancel out that, and you would get a linear display like this. Another side effect of encoding a brighter gamma into an image is that you also get more efficient coding, uh, coding efficiency when you quantize it into 8 bits. So here's a plot generously donated by Greg Ward that demonstrates the steps between black and white, how they are visually represented. If you quantize an image into 8 bits in linear, the steps in the dark end of the scale get too far apart and then you can perceive banding whereas when you encode them with a gamma of 2.2 the steps in the dark area are closer together and hence there's less visible banding so this is another reason why even to this day we have to deal with gamma encoded images because especially with fixed precision formats the necessity for gamma encoding is still there we're going to talk a little bit more about this in another section when we talk about the specifics of how Nuke brings images in and linearizes them. But I wanted to give you a little bit of background on what gamma was for those of you who weren't really clear on the gamma power function.